And how are we all doing? Praise, praise, praise God. Um, we do not take for granted the moment and the opportunity that we have to come together like this. I'm telling you, um, let, let me start by saying this. My wife was talking about having a revelation. And when she was saying that, one of the things that came to my mind was that a while ago, the Lord instructed me to teach around the manifestation of salvation. You see, salvation has always been. The Bible says that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth. So God's salvation has always been. But there are still people in the world today that have yet to experience the salvation of God. You know one of the promises that the people in the Old Testament laid hold of that they would always profess and claim is that may we see your salvation. You know what Moses was told by God? God told Moses, he said to him, be still and you will see my salvation. You know, it's a different thing if God had said to Moses, uh, be still, hold on, while I am fabricating salvation. He didn't say I'm about to make salvation. So when God told Moses to be still, it's for his own sake because the salvation of God is there. The salvation of God has always been there, but it takes a particular kind of posture and positioning for you and I to see it. Let me say this. There was one day the Lord took me in the spirit and he showed me what happened on the mountain when, Ab when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, his son. I sound a little different today and I'm not sure if I like it. How do I sound where you're at? Okay, I sound good. Okay, all righty, maybe I'll get used to it. Um, but when Abraham went to sacrifice Isaac, he was there having professed that the Lord is the provider. And maybe we can reduce the background a little bit. That's good. Oh yeah, don't worry, we'll fine tune it. We'll get to where we need to be. When Abraham was asked by Isaac, Isaac was like, Father, I see the wood. I see the fire. He said, but where is the sacrifice? And what did Abraham say? Abraham says that the Lord will provide. While they were going up the mountain, they didn't see any provision. When they got to the top of the mountain, they still did not see any provision. Abraham was not going to let his friend God down. As far as Abraham was concerned, God got whatever he asked for. And so he was willing to go all the way. Now some of, some of you need to go and hear that again. Some of us need to let that really fester within us that we have a friend who alone is worthy of all. I'm not talking about those friends that are always demanding. They're always asking you to do things for them. They're always coming to put their burden on you. They don't care whether you have any burdens of your own. They want themselves to be first. Anybody that demands to be first should be rejected. Because the word of God says that you need to prefer others before yourself. We all should be seeking to make other people first. But some people are always seeking to come first. So why do I say that anybody that is seeking to be first in your life, you need to reject them? The mother of Mary, uh, the mother of John and James, the sons of Zebedee, when she came to Jesus, she was rejected because she was asking for preferential treatment to be given to her boys. She said, Rabbi, I have a feeling you're going to make it through with this thing you're talking about, that you are the son of God. Maybe eventually you will get into your father's kingdom. When you get there, make sure that John and James, James and John, that they sit one to your right and the one to your left. And Jesus was like, no, I'm not buying what you're selling. 
That agenda is not of God. And Jesus immediately rebuked her and refuted what she had just proposed. He said to the cross section of the disciples, he said, whoever amongst you will aspire to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, he first of all must be the servant of all. What is the attribute of a servant? Or what are the attributes of a servant? One of the attributes of a servant that Jesus mostly commends is the one we find in Luke chapter 17 when Jesus says, who amongst you has a servant who would have worked all day and then come back home in the evening to relax? Who would first of all not ask the servant to feed him first? Jesus says a servant is supposed to always come last. The master comes first. And so when Jesus was saying, whoever amongst you desires to be the greatest, he must be willing to be the servant of all. So be mindful and be weary of those people who are, who are always demanding for them to come first in your life. They want the best of the time that you can give. They want the best of your prayers. And that is the reason why every single day they're texting you, pray for me. Pray for me. Oh, this is going on. Pray for me. Pray for me. Wait a minute. When have you ever texted me? Saying what Jesus said, I have prayed for you. Jesus never said pray for me. Jesus one time said pray with me. He says come and watch with me a little. Another time he says I have prayed for you. And several other times he prayed for people. But there are people who are always demanding to be first. But in any case, that's just by the way, I'm sure somebody needed to hear that. But I was talking about Abraham who recognized that not even his own son came first. That God always comes first. And so whatever God wants, God gets. God is the only person who is worthy to receive all. Who is worthy to receive our first fruits. Who is worthy to receive the best of us. Some of you or some people, however, I would say, are plagued by robbers. Simply because they have not given their best to God. If you refuse to give your best to God, you are sending an invitation to the thief that comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. God says the devourer will be rebuked for your sakes if you have already given to God your very best. Because the devourer is not looking for scrap. There is a lot of scrap in the world. Have you not looked around lately? You can get a thousand immoral people just like that. You can get a thousand backbiters just like that. You can get a million tail bearers just like that. You can get 10 million fearful people within any small radius. But the Bible says a faithful man who can find. So scraps are all over the place. So if you do not want to be the target of the enemy, then make sure that you give your very best to God. Do you know how it works? It works in such a way that the devil remains in active competition with God. He says unto me, the congregation of the people will come. That is what God is entitled to, being the creator of all things. The Bible says, unto the Lord shall the gathering of his people be. We talked about that a bit more extensively last week or maybe even on Tuesday. But what I am driving at is that whilst Satan is in constant and in aggressive competition with God, he wants to take what God is after. So if Satan comes and you've already given to God, what is God's? And you've given to Caesar, what is Caesar's? Now when Satan comes, he will find nothing in you. Because he's not looking for scrap. So if you want Satan to stop coming after you and troubling you the way that he has, make sure that nothing that is of God is being kept away from God. You give it to God and Satan will look at your life and see that, oh, another one bites the... Well, not the dust. He's the one biting the dust. He just, he just laments that he's lost another one. I'm just letting you know the secrets to ensuring that you don't constantly make yourself a target for the enemy. Make sure that you give to God what is God's. You see, because let me tell you something. There are people in our lives who are always looking to get that which belongs to God that you are holding on to. They do it subconsciously. They don't even know that that is what they're doing. Can I give you an example? The Bible says that God is worthy to receive all the glory, honor, and power. That is the reason why people are always looking to take glory for whatever you become or for whatever you are. 
People hold things back from you because they're like, if I don't show up, then it's not going to make it. And if they see you making it, they still want to take glory for it anyway. They say things like, oh, if not for us, that we helped you back in the day, do you think you will be where you are today? Because of the fact that man is made in the image and in the likeness of God, man has very similar appetite to that of God. So if you do not give to God what is God's, people will attempt to take it from you. They would want to take the glory. They would want to take the honor. They would want to take the praise. Whereas the Bible says only God is worthy of all those things. You give to God what is God's and don't let anybody make you feel bad for you not giving them credit, for you not giving them glory. The Bible says give honor to whom honor is due. There are times when honor is due to a man for fruits that they have borne, for faithfulness that they have shown. But do not let anybody make you feel guilty when you are not led to give to them what is God's. The Bible already lets you know that you are not on the hook for anything. What does the Bible say? The Bible say, oh, no man, nothing but love. You do not owe anybody an explanation. Do you know that many people demand you to give them an explanation for how you're living your life? But what does the Bible say? God is the only one that demands and deserves the explanation. He says, come and let us reason together. If your sin be as red as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. God is the only one that is interested in those details. He says, no, you don't have to serve it up to anybody. My intention when I made you is for you to remain a mystery. But people always want to understand the mystery behind you. So that they can love you more? No, so that they can control you. People want to know where God has hidden all your buttons. And that is the reason why you don't want to let them know what you like or what you don't like. Because the moment they know what you like, they will find it wherever it is and hide it from you. So that you can be looking for it and be miserable and sad. And they'll be like, wait, wait until she comes to me. I know what I'm saying. I've done it before. I told you the story when I was in primary six, which is like, what, middle school? Right? Whatever that is. Like seventh grade. All right? Because we Okay, so it's not forward, it's backwards. Okay, so when I was in fifth grade, there was this guy, he was always at my back and call. He did whatever I said. If I said sit, he sat. And I got used to being the boss of him. Don't worry, I'm not the person that I used to be. And so one day, I pushed him too far and he snapped. I wasn't even bothered. <laughs> I was like, he's coming back. Because right from the beginning of the school year, he's never had a pen of his own. He's always coming to me to ask for a pen. At the beginning of every period, he'll come and say, can I have that pen that you gave me yesterday? Because I always made sure that I collected my pen back at the end of the day so that the following day, he would need me again. I was very intentional about how I controlled him. And so I said he was going to be back. So when he snapped, I just let him go. And you know what happened? The next day, he didn't come to ask for my pen. And I was waiting. I waited at the end of the first period. He didn't ask for my pen. The second period, he didn't ask for my pen. After like a week, I was the one who went to him. Because I realized that I had lost the power that I had over him. He found a pen somewhere else. It was my greatest disappointment in that season of life. That was when I realized that I was not his God. Let me tell you something. People will try to be God in your life if you do not let them. Remember those seasons in your life when you were a baby believer and you didn't know how to access the abundance that God has for you in heavenly places and you used to go to people to borrow? How they used to talk you down like they made you? And how they would say things like, hey, 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 if you're coming here to borrow money, then you don't talk like that. They even want to control how you talk because you have given them the power to believe that they are God and they are the provider in your life. But we don't do that no more. Why? Because we have come to learn that once I put God in his place in my life, naturally man will find his place. Anyway, let's go back to the story of Abraham. Don't worry, it seems like one of those services we might be branching here and branching there, but we will get there eventually. So Abraham was going up the mountain. With Isaac, they got to the mountain. The entire time, he was focused on giving to God what was God's. God wants a sacrifice, he gets a sacrifice. But do you know that the entire time that they were there, 
Now let me say this. God is very, very calculative in the way that he shows his power so that nobody has an excuse to give his glory to another. If God had asked them to go to an open field, then you may have said that perhaps the ram came from somewhere nearby. But there was only one way to get onto the mountain. And they didn't see the ram on their way up. And while they were there, they didn't see the ram come through. The ram was already there. It was already caught in a thicket, but they did not see it yet. That is the way the salvation of God works. The Lord did not allow a cow or a bull or an oxen. No, he made sure that it was a ram so that it can be truly symbolic of the salvation of God. The emblem of the salvation of God is a lamb that was slain. And so here is the deal. The salvation of God is always there, but you and I need to learn the secrets of unfolding the salvation by revelation. There is no salvation without revelation. When my wife was speaking earlier as we were praying, it just hit me. And it was almost like the Holy Spirit rewound the tape for me to hear again the things that he once told me about that concept. And he said, I needed to share it with you again today. Because many of us are still awaiting for certain things that we had petitioned of God to become apparent. And God is not working on it. Because the Bible says in Genesis that God rested from all his work. There is nothing that you're asking God for that God is just working on. He has already done it because he does everything by the word of his power and already is what he's retired. The Bible says forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. He told the Lord Jesus, he said, arise and sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. The word of God is not working it out. You are the one that needs to work out how you are going to receive what has already been done. And the process of receiving the salvation of God is recognizing what you don't know that you need to know. Revelation is the key. So I want to encourage you today. And in fact, we're going to do something a little different today. We will break bread this very moment. And I want you to open your heart and release every ounce of faith that you can muster from the inside of you to allow for yourself, enjoy the fullness of the privilege of this ritual. What do I mean? This ritual of breaking bread was instituted by the Lord Jesus himself. And every single time that the resurrected Jesus had fellowship with people and he broke bread with them, their eyes were open to see what otherwise they couldn't see. So I want you to say to yourself today, heart open up, faith be activated. Because as we break bread, I need revelation that has to do with my salvation. You see, the salvation of God is the totality of everything that God has done that you will need as a man. Defined in another verse of scripture that it is everything that pertains to life and godliness. Your happiness in life is a function of salvation. Your health the relationships that you have, the cordiality that you enjoy with people, the insights you have into the things that God is doing upon the earth. Even when you study the word of God and you receive revelation, everything is part of your entitlement that is wrapped in that overall heavenly package that is called salvation. And so it is now up to you to determine if you will continue to leave treasures on the table. If you will continue to leave salvation on access and underutilized. All of that is up to you. Do you know that God never changes? I had an interesting experience while we were here. As the worship was going on, Anita was singing the best that I had ever heard her sing. It was awesome. All the pyrotechnics were coming out. We always knew she had it. But maybe we just needed a bass player. Because that's what we've been missing for a while. A bass player. And today, look at what Happy was doing on that bass guitar. Anita was following him. She was doing, let me say this in case Anita's husband is watching. She wasn't literally following the man. She was following the rhythm of the bass guitar. And I wanted to sing along with her. And my voice was telling me, what do you think you're doing? 
my voice did not let me because of how I had managed my voice in the last couple of days. The atmosphere in this place was not different from what it was on Tuesday because the faithfulness of God guarantees that wherever two or three of us are gathered in his name, he is there in the midst of us. The reason why I couldn't tap into that song as much as I wanted to was not because God's faithfulness was diminished unto me. It was because my voice was just not able to ride as high. The faithfulness of God is such that when you show up in his presence, he is always there. How much of him you enjoy and how much of what he has for you, you take home, is very much a function of you and your ability to receive. Because you are the only changing factor in the relationship and covenant that God has with you. The covenant that God has with you is unwavering. It never changes. Brother Matthew, God is not learning how to love you better. Because when he loved you, how did he love you? He loved you with an everlasting love. That is the reason why the Bible says we're more than conquerors. A conqueror has to fight, but a more than conqueror does not have to. Simply because he has already won and he has won forever. Because the Bible says we are more than, than conquerors because of him who has loved us with an everlasting love. Because it is love that wins. And so because he has loved you forever, guess what? It is not a function of whether God is able or not. It is a function of if you are ready or not. You know, when I had that revelation, it was one of those things that initially sounded too good to be true. So I had to start, I, I scolded myself. I said, wait a minute. When I pray and I feel the potent power of God run through my body, and I feel my body shake and I feel like the heavens are open. It's not that God is in a better mood that day than he is the day that I do not feel the shaking. He is the same. He never changes. So I am the one with the responsibility to get myself to the place wherein I can experience the fullness of what he brings. You see, the more we have that revelation, the less emotions can control our reception. You know, there are times wherein if somebody annoys you, especially when you have an argument in the car before getting to service, you cannot receive as much in service. So is God punishing you because you had an argument? Or God is saying, oh, well, I don't know how to, how to do this because he's not in a good mood. So maybe I'm just going to keep my blessing to myself. No. The Bible says even when we are unfaithful, God is faithful. Because God is not going to allow you to determine how he is God. Because what that means is now you can control God. So he is God nonetheless. So what really happens is your emotions determine your reception. Because when you're feeling good. And this is what happens to most people. And I'm thankful for the path that God is taking us at Communion House. There are so many people that if the worship is not great... If the music is not excellent, they're like, oh, worship was somehow today. And in reality, they did not receive any joy. Because of the fact that their emotions were not excited to the level wherein they could have received insights and revelations. Some of you here can bear me witness. You've seen me shaking, laid on my face, downloading revelations from heaven while we were dancing to YouTube videos. YouTube videos that have been long recorded some of the ones that we've played and danced to, the people who recorded them have long gone to heaven. Nothing to do with anything. And still, I will be there soaking up on revelations. I've seen angels walk in and out or walk around in the room and we're listening to somebody who is just learning how to play the guitar. I'm not going to mention his name. You understand what I mean? Because I have come to recognize that it is not how my emotions are, but it is how God's goodness is. And because his goodness is always constant, I do not allow anything to tamper with my expectation. My expectation of what God will do should not be a function of what I can do. It should still be a function totally of what he can do. Do I believe that God can heal? Yes. Do I have to pray and fast for two years before I lay my hands on the sick? No, because it is not by power nor by might. The reason why I pray and fast and wait on the Lord and intercede, the reason why I do those things, including meditate, is so that I can get my heart to the place where it can actually truly believe that God is able and expect that God will. 
You're not doing those things you're doing to change God's posture. Everything you do, you do to change your own posture. You see, because God has a timetable that he's working with. The Bible says he makes everything beautiful in its time. So you determine whether you come up on God's schedule or not. I was sharing, was it Alan that I was sharing with the other day about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? No, maybe not you. I was sharing with somebody about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, it was John. I said the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, the reason why they were destroyed by fire was because they time jumped. Let me explain that slowly. You see, God has a timetable for everything, right? He already told Noah, he said, don't worry, I'm no longer going to destroy the earth by flood. Okay? And I told you, let me, let me just say this for the benefit of those who are not here. I believe very strongly that one of the reasons why the um, LGBTQ community uses the rainbow, not the rainbow, they don't use the rainbow. They use a similitude of the rainbow is because unknown to people who identify with that social construct is the fact that Satan has engineered a deception into the world to tell people they do not need God. That they themselves as men have now become God unto themselves. You know, seven is the number of God. Six is the number of men. The true rainbow that you see in the sky is the reflection is what happens when light is refracted through a prism. It gives you seven distinct colors, right? In science, what did they teach you at school? Elementary school, they said the rainbow is the reflection of light through water because water can function as a prism or a medium for refraction. But however you swing it, the rainbow in the natural is always seven colors. These guys came up with six colors. Now, I tell you this not to judge or condemn anybody, but I tell you this so that you can know the extent of ignorance that has gone into the world and people are falling for these things without even understanding what they're doing. God says my people perish not because of their liberties, but because of the lack of knowledge. What you're seeing today is not excessive application of liberty that comes by the blood of the Lamb. It is a function of ignorance because people fail to understand the things of God. The devil would do that because it's like, no, you don't have to go to the number seven. You stop at number six. Today, earlier today, I saw a woman on TV. She wore a t-shirt and they literally showed light passing through a prism and six colors came out. I'm like, people are now trying to bend the natural. When Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 that from the visible elements of this world we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God and of the eternal powers. The eternal powers constitute the seven spirits of God. So what they're trying to do is they are trying to eliminate one so that they can keep people completely at the level of men. Don't just take my words for it, look around. Since we had that six color symbol being thrown around, what we have also seen is more of people saying that, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna live my truth. You don't have any truth. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, we lie, and the truth is not in us. The only truth there is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no truth that you can claim to be your own. But that happened at the same time as that symbol was being put in the faces of people because men have failed to recognize that there was a reason why God drew the rainbow in the skies and he explained himself. <laughs> Let me tell you something. As human beings, we respond very greatly to the things that we see. Whether we like it or not, subliminal messages can be sent to you as a, as a human being by what you see. Even your little iPhone is telling you the same thing. You point your iPhone to a QR code and it takes you to a website. Just that QR code that looks like chicken scratch. And that is because pictures tell more than a thousand words. So if I were to sit down here or stand here and describe to Manolita what an offering slide looks like, we might be here till kingdom come, 
While I'm still trying to describe the background, the text, the font, the font size, and none of those things, I could just show her a picture. I just like, oh, that's it. I get it now. I'll see you on Tuesday. Because pictures are powerful. So what God did was, God wanted to communicate to Noah the extent of his love and the plan that he has ahead. But Noah had just been through a rough season in his life. He's been living in the same apartment with animals for days, for months. The guy just wanted a break from every long explanation that can be. And so God was like, don't worry, I'm not going to saddle you with details. I'm just going to show you a picture. And the moment God showed Noah that picture, you know what Noah did? Noah was like, that's it. I know what to do. And the Bible says he became a farmer. <laughs> do you know why somebody will see a rainbow in the sky and become a farmer? Two things. Hope. His hope was restored because he had seen the most devastation that anybody had ever seen. The entire population of the earth was reduced to eight people just almost overnight. So with all that devastation, he had no hope. We saw that later on because Satan came and challenged the word that he had received from God. And when he looked up and he couldn't see the rainbow for a season, he lost hope once again and he became a alcoholic. But in that very moment, while he was still looking at that rainbow, his hope was revived and he went to the farm. He went to cultivate because it's like, I don't have to worry about water washing away the crop because God gave his word. And if what he's bringing at the end of the day is fire, praise the Lord because I need fire for the harvest to burn away the chaff. For every reason that could apply to a man's understanding, Noah knew that the rainbow was a good thing. Just one picture. And God changed the psyche of that man forever. So why would Satan not do the same? Satan started to show people just one picture. He started to show people an adulterated version of the rainbow that tells them that the Lord is not coming. And you know that they say that thing everywhere you go to? They say no one is coming. Have you not been hearing that? There are several versions of that. They say it in movies. They say it in TV shows. They say it in memes. They keep repeating the same thing that no one is coming. No one's going to pull you up. You have to do it by yourself. Then, so if I have to do it by myself, then please, why do I need a God? Or why do I have a God? He said he's the glory and the lifter of my head. So why do I need to break my neck trying to lift myself? I can't even lift myself. Physics tells me that I can't. If I pull myself by the pants and I jump up, I guarantee you I will land exactly where I took off from. That's a guarantee. Without some external help. But Satan is showing people this six color rainbow so that they can lose the consciousness of God in their hearts. I want to encourage you. Watch out for what your children are buying. If you have little children that want to buy toys, if I, we've taught the ones in our household you count every single color. If it's not seven colors, you drop it. It doesn't matter how good the intentions are of whoever is doing it. I don't care about their intentions because when you're ignorant, your intentions are equally ignorant. The Bible says you cannot expect a bad tree to produce good fruit by the fruits we shall know them. And so that's why I'm not going to expect to get an apple from a thorn bush. No, it has to be a good tree. So what I'm showing you is look at the fruits it doesn't matter if the person says that they're a good organization. Is it six or seven? If it is six, we say no to it. Now, I'm saying all of that because of the fact that I want you all to know that we have come to such a time wherein revelation is everything. Satan is packaging his own revelation. And we see the outcome of it. But going back to this concept of the rainbow, one of the things that I have come to know is that if God says he will no, no longer do a thing, he will no longer do a thing, but he will tell you what he will do instead. Because every time he says that your sins, I will remember no more, then what does he say after that? He says, I will crown you with my goodness. My goodness and my mercy will follow you because God, the one who makes everything, knows that the world that he created has no room for a vacuum. Something has to always fill every place. So, if you do not have revelations of what God has in his salvation, you will receive the revelation of what Satan has in his deprivation that he has. So, you need to keep your attention on things above and not on things beneath. So, let me go back and finish what I was saying. Before I started talking about the rainbow, I told you that Sodom and Gomorrah, 
the reason why they were destroyed by fire, the time jumped because God already has a time that is set for all the earth to be burned by fire. And God said that I will bring fire to destroy the world again when immorality fills the earth and that time when the cup of wickedness is full. <laughs> so God already set it in motion. And now he's in eternity. He doesn't even have to worry about it because he has already set it into motion. His angels are waiting for that particular indicator. And the moment they see that the cup of wickedness is full, what do they do? They move in to start the fire. Let me say that again slowly. God already said it. And that is exactly what will happen. When immorality fills the earth and when the cup of wickedness is full, the fire will come. Guess what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Sodom and Gomorrah partnered with fallen angels to advance their technology, their sorcery, their magic. They advanced everything to the point wherein they exceeded the limit of reasonable appetite and their appetites became insatiable and that is the reason why they went and consulted with a reprobate mind and started having all kinds of immorality and wickedness amongst them. Go and study about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a technology, was a technology driven society. Was a society that was very advanced on fallen angel technology. And because of fallen angel technology, guess what had happened? They had put their hearts on overdrive. Food alone was not satisfying them. They had to be drunk. Having sex between a man and a woman could no longer satisfy them. They had to be having men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women and human beings sleeping with animals because they had their hearts on overdrive. And by so doing, what they called knowledge was actually ignorance because that drove them ahead of their time into the future and the moment their cup of wickedness was full the fire came and you and I both know when their cup of wickedness was full God said I have observed there is immorality all over Sodom and Gomorrah and I am getting ready to do something about it but the Lord did not give his angels the full go ahead until the people of Sodom and Gomorrah laid their hands on the Lord's anointed Please, I want you to stay with me because I have been in the presence of the Lord these few days, especially to understand the reason why we are experiencing the kind of persecution that we're experiencing. I know we prophesied about it. I told my wife about two days ago. I said, when I was prophesying, not just me, but a couple of other people are in, the, in various pockets of the world that, oh, especially around 2018, 2019, we were talking about the fact that, oh, we need to be ready for persecution. We sounded so excited about it. And when the persecution came, he was like, oh my God, he, he feels different <laughs> than what it looked like. When we saw the vision, it was exciting. But when we were going through the, the, the attacks, it was no longer as exciting. We had to learn a new kind of excitement in the midst of tribulation. You understand what I mean? And so I've been seeking the Lord because other people have come to me saying, are you experiencing this? Are you experiencing that? I'm like, exactly what you have said is what we are going through as well. And so I'm like, Lord, I'm happy with the answers that I have given, but I know that there is more. Give me fresh insight. And the Lord said to me, he says, it's the cup of wickedness. To fill up the cup of wickedness is to lay hand on my sent ones. The moment the people sent by God are now being attacked by the masses, then the cup of wickedness is full. And what are we seeing in the world today? Anybody that stands on the truth, the people threaten to stone. Anyone that stands on the truth of the word of God to declare it with boldness, the world turns against you. Are we not where Sodom and Gomorrah, where Sodom and Gomorrah were when the Lord gave his angels the full swing to go ahead and take them out? I say all of those things so that you know that our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. But this version of salvation is called redemption. And what it means is fire will first of all come to consume the tears. Now let me, I skipped over like three things because I wanted to quickly land that thought. But I know that I have to talk to you about those three things. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah, time jumped. They started performing so much immorality 
and wickedness that there was no other allowance for them to live one more day. They had exhausted everything. In the world that we're living in today, we're getting close to exhausting everything also. Especially now that Satan is releasing his foxes after men who are speaking the truth of the word of God. Let me tell you something. God is not going to allow them to cast a stone, but he would allow for them to raise their hand. And the moment they raise their hand, he will release the fire. You know that the angels that were to be molested by the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was like, but I've got beautiful girls. They have never been with a man. You can have my daughters. And the men outside of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were like, we don't want your daughters. That would be like doing the right thing. Somewhat. But they're like, no, we don't want anything that looks even right. We want all the wrong stuff. We want a rainbow with six colors. Please, don't give us the right stuff. We want all the things upside down. We don't want the boundaries of God. Because remember that there was, even though when Lot was living, there was a blessing of God that came upon his life as he was departing from Abraham, that the Lord would be the edge around him. And so that boundary of his house was the edge of the Lord and they wanted to penetrate that boundary. And so when people are trying to break down boundaries that are set by God, they ask for it. And at that particular moment, even though they couldn't lay their hands on those angels because blindness came upon them, the fact that they stretched forth their hands, that was all God needed to see. And the trumpet sounded over Sodom and Gomorrah. And the end came for Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, the gory, or what I tell you might sound like a gory tale, but for every gory tale, there is a glory side. The glory side to what I have just told you is that you and I are actually expected by God to time jump freely. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah, their destruction came because they fulfilled the conditions of a particular time in future. <laughs> Let me just share with you this one more secret. This one is actually totally free. Here is the deal. Sodom and Gomorrah, 3,000 years ago, they lived their lives like it was 2028. 20, they were drinking the wine of immorality and they were swimming in wickedness. And so the judgment of that time came upon them and they were destroyed by fire. But their judgment came after the angels were already boots on the ground. What have I been telling you since last year? The angels of God their boots on the ground. What they're doing is very simple. What they did in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah was what? They were going around on God's assignment, being the eyes and the feet of God, seeking to see if by any chance there are righteous men because God did not want to mistakenly, God does not make mistakes, but God does not want it to be such that some righteous men get destroyed with Sodom and Gomorrah. God already knew that there were no righteous people, but he needed it to be very plain and apparent because God said to us, he says, do not let your good be evil spoken of. And so God himself does not allow his own good to be evil spoken of because if God had just gone and said, well, I am God, I know all things, I know that there were no righteous people, so I destroyed the place. Abraham could have said, but God, I mean, come on. What if we had gone in there and investigated and so God did not want him to have an excuse or anybody to have an excuse. So he sent his angels to go amongst them to make sure that the wheat are very clearly distinct from the tears. If you don't know the story, let me quickly tell you. Jesus told his disciples, he said there was a certain man who had a field and he instructed his servants to plant wheat on that field. He said, and after the servants had planted the field full of wheat, they went to sleep and while they slept, the adversary came and planted tears. When they woke up, the master said to them, is this not my field? Why do I have tears amongst wheat? And the, the servants were like, oh master, we're so sorry. It was whilst we slept that they crept in the enemies came in and the, so, the, the enemy came in and it crept in and sowed tears. Let us quickly go and fix the mess. And the master says, no, it's not your job. You cannot fix this. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to explain myself or give an excuse for the attitude that I have towards some people lately or the position that I have taken. 
You know, I have taken the position and I'm encouraging you to do the same of the five wise virgins who said to the foolish ones, we're not giving you any oil. Because if we gave you the oil, then that which we have is no longer going to be enough for me and you. So they kept all the oil to themselves because it was the right thing to do. It was the time that they had come to. Does it make sense? Now, I am telling you and encouraging you to be very sensitive who you pray for, who you spend your time with. Because Jesus says to not cast your pearl before swine. We have come to such a time that we need to recognize that it is not our duty to do certain things. The master told the servants, you people were not made to separate wheat from tears. You were made to receive wheat and make bread and be happy. He said to them, he says, my father will send his angels into the field and they will separate the wheat from the tears. Amen. Somebody recently, one of my dear friends, he came to me and he said to me, he says, pastor, he said, um, I miss those hours of prophetic impartation. How many people remember that for like the first two years of communion house? There were meetings where I prophesied for three, four hours. And I will call people out by their name individually and prophesy over them. Prophesy. And the room will be full. People will sit on the staircase hoping that when they show their face, I will know that they're there and wave. And some of them will offer to bring me water so that I can know that they're in the building so I can call them out and prophesy. We ran that show for a while by the intention and the design of God because of the times that we're in. And one day we were in a room full of people. It was close to midnight. Some people were still hanging about because they hadn't gotten no. Do you know people will follow me outside the meeting just so that because they know that once they get my attention, they will get a word. Oh yeah, I, I, so, I, oh, Holy Spirit, activate. <laughs> Please, just delete that from your memory. Because I don't even know what I just did there. You know what happened? I was standing and there were still people in the room. It was close to midnight and the Holy Spirit said to me, <laughs> he just whispered it to me. He said, and Jesus drove away the multitude. Oh. I was like, but I like the multitude. Because I immediately knew what he was saying. And then after a while, he sat me down. And I've, you know, in one of the messages that I have preached here, I taught you, I think it was just before we left the basement, I told you exactly what the Holy Spirit told me about what was going on with people. He showed me people that I had handed the pearls of the kingdom to, that I had prophesied over. And he says, this person, look at what they got from the word that he gave them. The reason why they fell off the edge was because they were trying to own that word that was given instead of them to submit themselves to the word. And he said, from now on, I want you to teach the mysteries of the kingdom. I didn't make the switch. The Holy Spirit made the switch because it was meant to be a sign and a witness, a testament to the times that we have come to. Guess what happened while we were having worship today? The Holy Spirit said to me, he said, do you know the reason why certain people are not here? He said, because I know the compassion of your heart. Every time you stand to minister, you keep releasing virtues. He said, but I needed you to conserve in this season because of the arrows of the enemy. So please do not sorrow. If some people don't want to play with you anymore, God is protecting you. He's helping you to conserve that which you carry so that it will be enough for you because if you give to them, it will not be enough for them. It will not be enough for you. Why is it not going to ever be enough for them? Because they are not with God. Oh, Shakum Askeleu. You can never be satisfied unless you have God. The Bible says that godliness with contentment is great gain. You can't have complete. The Bible did not say godliness and contentment. That will make them two things. Contentment is an attribute of godliness. I told my wife, someone, someone reached out to me recently, hounding me for money. And I told my wife, I said, no. <laughs> and you know, the reason why I said no is because the Lord showed me what would happen after I give her the money. The Lord took me to see 
her attitude after I gave her the money. The amount that I would have given to her of what she was asking, she looked at it and she was like, is this all he could have done? He has more money than that. He could have done more than that. Is this how much I mean to him? And the Lord said, this is the reason why I am telling you to not cast your pearl. Because the people that do not move in godliness are never going to be content. That is the reason why Antonio, no matter how much you bust your behind for them, they will still bite that finger. These are the last days. Wake up, brothers and sisters. The Bible says in the last days, men will become unthankful. Men will become ungrateful. Seekers of their own pleasures and lovers of money rather than be lovers of God. And so if God already told you that that is the way of men in the last days, then should you not bring your discernment to bear and allow that to guide your discretion? We can no longer be led by sympathy. We have to be led by the Holy Spirit simply because you will do things for people while you're not being led by God and still they will spit in your face and then you will be at a double loss, double jeopardy. And then you will cry and go to God. I say, God, look at what they're doing to me. And God is like, it's what you're doing to you because I told you. Be led by the Spirit. So that is the posture that I have taken. And I am encouraging you to take the same posture unless the Lord reveals to you. And then when the Lord reveals to you, God expects you to test all spirits that you may know that which is of God. I am no longer moved by people's tears and long stories of the reason why we need to be a blessing to them. No, I need to make sure that your heart has godliness or is godly. Otherwise, everything that we can do, that we do becomes trivial. They, they trivialize it. There are people that we have bent over backwards, done stuff for. Where are they today? Speaking evil of us. Is it their fault? No, it is because that is the times that we have come to. Men have become unthankful simply because when they were supposed to embrace God and chase God with all their hearts, they were chasing fame, they were chasing worldliness, and they were chasing money. And look at what it got them. An insatiable appetite that opens them for the commandment of Satan. Because people that have insatiable appetite, Satan can control them all the time because they're always hungry. Oh, where am I going to get this? Who is going to recognize me? Or oh, who is going to give me this invitation to come and speak at their church? What if I slap a fake title in front of my name? That's the reason why everybody's getting a fake PhD today. Just because they're looking for things that are not lost. I know some people who did not say happy birthday to me a few days ago and that was because when they were getting their fake PhDs I didn't congratulate them because God forbid that I cast my pearl before swine no you are the one who needs to repent and if you refuse to repent shame on you the wise virgins said to the foolish ones go to the ones who are selling go and buy isn't that what you do go and buy you have always been buying stuff why don't you go and buy this one too we didn't buy this one. We juiced this one in the wine press so we know the value of what we have. It is only people who do not know the value of the anointing that will be tossing it around like it's child's play. Oh, the Bible says the days of ignorance, the Lord has winked at. There were times when in, oh, a, very, a, a very dear friend of mine before he passed away, you know what he said to me? He said, Moses, he says, I have stopped praying for people that God did not pray for. He made me think, that in Jesus' ministry, he prayed for people. And Jesus says, whatsoever I do is that which I see my father do. So when he said to Peter, Peter, I have prayed for you, it's because the father prayed for Peter. So he said to me, he said, I don't pray for people that God hasn't prayed for. He said, because some people just come and because you just feel like, oh, I'm anointed. I'm a brother, I'm in Christ. As soon as they table their trouble before me, I just say, in the mighty name of Jesus. A lot of such prayers were saying out of our own flesh. We're not led to say it. Some people, they don't need you to pray for them. They just need you to tell them off. Some people, they don't need you to pray for them. They just need you to tell them the truth. The Bible says open rebuke is better than love that is carefully concealed. I know that I'm supposed to tell that brother to stop being silly. But I would now conceal it in prayer. I would not be trying to use the words of prayer to encourage him. No, I am not doing that anymore. What I would do is I would just tell you the truth. You take it or you leave it because I ain't got time to be fooling around and to be massaging anybody's ego. I owe nobody nothing but the love. Right. 
So we're going to pray. Now the Lord opens our eyes that we may see that which holds our petitions. You know that was what I was saying when I, when I asked Alan to give us the communion because the ram is caught in the thicket already. And many of us are living without certain things that we have petitioned of the Lord. Those things that constitute the elements or the verses of our testimonies. Those things that constitute the items of our joy and peace. And we're lacking those things. And God is like, you should lack nothing good. Because I have given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. So what is there as a gap between what you are missing and what God has already done is a function of the revelation that you have. Okay, I don't think you all got it just yet. So let's use some examples. Alrighty. Let's use the same example from the verse that my wife read from Matthew 16. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And they went on and on. They said, you're this, they said, you're that. And Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter, was, Peter said, you are Christ, son of the living God. Now, I don't have time. I'm not going to take time to explain it, but I want you to try and see if you can find one of the messages that I preached, I think, in 2019, wherein I broke it down. But I'm going to give you some pointers. In fact, you can go and find it in scriptures on your own, okay? It might even be easier for you to find it in scripture than, than to be going through all of YouTube archives for communion house. Jesus told Peter, that flesh and blood did not reveal to you what you said. That used to be confusing to many theologians. Why? Because we know that Peter was Andrew's brother. Right? And Andrew was John the Baptist's right-hand man. When John the Baptist was waiting in the river to baptize Jesus, who was standing next to him? Andrew. Because Andrew was once a disciple of John. So it's not today that people have been leaving one ministry to go to another. John, Andrew, and Peter, they left John's ministry. They went to join Jesus' ministry because he was the new shining thing in town. Anyway, let's go back to Andrew. Andrew was there. And when John the Baptist saw Jesus from afar, he was like, wait a minute. Is he who I think he is? He says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Andrew heard it. And the Bible says, Andrew said to Peter, come, we have seen the one of whom prophecy spoke about. You see what I mean? Peter received a secondary revelation. But every time a person receives that information and they allow the Holy Spirit to release a unique insight to them, it becomes a personal revelation. When John told Andrew, he said, behold the Lamb of God. When Andrew was telling Peter, he was telling him that we have seen the Messiah. Now, John did not say that's the Messiah. He says that's the Lamb of God. But inside of Andrew, it became another revelation that that is the Messiah. When Andrew told Peter, what did he tell Peter? He says, this is the Messiah. But when Jesus asked Peter, what did Peter say? Peter says, you are Christ. But he didn't stop there. That was something that he heard from flesh and blood. But then in addition to that, he says, but you are the son of God. Oh, and Jesus was like, ha ha, you are Peter. And upon this rock, which is the rock of revelation, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What I am doing is what John did to Andrew. What I am doing is like what Andrew did to Peter. But what Peter stood in front of Jesus to declare is what you need to do with the teachings and the revelations and the prophecies that are coming forth. You need to learn how to present it back to the Holy Spirit and say, breathe on it, O breath of God. If the testimonies that I share of the abundance of God, if the testimonies that I share of the prosperity of God, of the peace of the Son of Man, of the joy of the Holy Spirit, are just received by you, hook, line, and sinker, framed in a glass, it's not likely to bring you the fullness of that revelation. Because you need to learn how to make it your own. Because when it was brought from heaven, it had my name on it. But at least now you know that this same Moses received that because Jesus died for him and that same Jesus died for me. Thank you for encouraging my faith with your revelation. Now I am going to get my own. 
That was why Jesus said to Peter, you have progressed beyond what flesh and blood told you. Because I knew what John told Andrew. I knew what Andrew told you. But now you have received this one of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I will build my church on that. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Your salvation experience is only made complete and established after you have learned how to download the personal revelation from God. And we have come into such a season wherein the angels of the Lord are now once again boots on the ground. Let me quickly put those two things together for you because like I said, I skipped three things. Two of them are different. The third one is all two together. So that's what I'm doing now. I'm on the third thing that I skipped. Bring them all two together. I started telling you that there are angels around, boots on the ground. Number one, as a sign to you that we have come to where Sodom and Gomorrah were because the angels of the Lord went into Sodom and Gomorrah and they were carrying out an investigative exercise to know the ones who are of God and the ones who are of their bellies. The ones who will seek God and the ones who will seek their pleasure. And they had an opportunity to repent, but they didn't. But the angels of God were there. And Jesus told his disciples that God sends his angels to separate the wheat from the tears because you cannot do it. So stop trying to save a people that you cannot save. Because in the process, you will, you will mess everything up. You will pull the tears thinking that you're pulling out the wheat and then you will do the same, vice versa. He says, let the angels do their work. And what is going on? I announce to you by the grace of God in the year 2020 that we have come to the season of the angels separating the wheat from the tears. It is an exercise that requires the precision of angels, not the funkiness of men. Because you know, we can be very funky about everything and, and messy. And God just likes it that way because he designs us for a different purpose. You see, the angels are here. Learn their assignment, but also be mindful of their assignment. You see what I mean by learn their assignment is know the reason why they're here, but also be mindful that they're here and make use of it. You understand what I mean? And so you need to have your own personal revelation on how to tap into the ministry of angels in these last days. It is very critical, very crucial. And because the angels are here, things are happening much faster. Why? Because when the angels of the Lord descend in accordance with the word of God, they set up a ladder whose top reaches the heavens. Only they have access to heaven like that. Wherein they're coming up and they're coming down. When God came to take Enoch, chariot of fire when he took Elijah chariot of fire but when angels come down they can actually just go up and down a ladder system and that is the reason why things are sped up in the world things are moving quickly in the world because the only time things happen that quickly in the world is when angels set up their ladder so the third thing that I want you to draw from the presence of angels is that there is no more time because the moment angels are here is show time so Anita, you don't want Jesus to come. And rather than presenting your good works, you're presenting excuses. I say, oh, if only I had that $1 million that I was asking for the other day. Let me tell you something, everything that you need has already been released. And you're like, oh my God, I wouldn't have slapped that lady if only I had the patience that you promised. No, God is saying everything that pertains to life and godliness. You need money to do life. You need patience to be in godliness. Everything, everything, both material and spiritual, everything has been provided for. So it is your business now to seek the revelation that allows you to download it. Because when Peter had that revelation, Jesus said, now you have everything that you need. I am building on you. I am building through you. And I am building for you. So what do you and I need to do in the times that we're in? Spend time with the Lord. Ask him questions. Talk to him. Be thankful for the teaching. Be thankful for the prophetic. But then take it back to him and say, Lord, you said this through your servant. And I believe it. But now I want it to become mine. I want my own signature by your hand upon this blessing so that I can receive my own. Because everything that you need has been given, you can no longer afford to live in deprivation. Because the people who are living in deprivation have only one thing to present and that is excuses. I'm going to leave you on that note, but not until I've read to you from Isaiah chapter 43. You know, I told you that we are in the season of Isaiah 43. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 43 
I'm going to read verse 3. And maybe I'll read one more and then we'll break bread. But let's first of all go through verse 3. It says, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Hear me and hear me good, communion house and people of God. The Lord says, I gave Egypt as a ransom for you. What does Egypt mean before the Lord? Egypt is God's name for the world system. Jesus is coming and when Jesus comes, do you know the government that would have taken over the world by the time Jesus comes? That government is called in prophecy, Egypt and Sodom. Oh yeah, the, yeah in the prophecy, what the angels were telling John, they told John that that mystery Babylon, that system is called Egypt, but it is also called Sodom. And I've explained to you that it is called Egypt in its regimentation and Sodom in its immorality. You understand what I mean? It's called what Egypt because it's very regimented. You have to do this, you have to do that. You are, you are being watched all the time. You are like a slave within the system. The system watches you. When it's about to get easy, then guess what? They're like, man, this thing is getting too easy. Now go and make brick without straw. Look at how easy it was getting for people to make money from real estate. And they're like, mm, we're going to jack up the... Uh, What's what that thing called again? The interest rate. And now they're like, yeah, let's see them make brick without straw. But when God was with the children of Israel, they made brick without straw and it was not even trouble. So you can still make it no matter what the system dictates. So be encouraged. But what I am saying is, God says, you see that entire Egypt, I will give it to you. So there is nothing that you need, even to the extent of giving to you the neck of your enemies. God says and so that you don't accidentally get sucked back into the foot of your, your enemies. He says, I've already prepared Ethiopia and Seba to take your place where you were. God guarantees that the moment you have a revelation of who you are in him and you come out from within the grip of Satan that you don't return there. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Yes. But it takes you having personal revelation. Can I prove that to you real quick? Come with me to verse 18 of this Isaiah 43. And what does it say? Emmanuel, God bless you, man. Thank you so much. 14, I mean 43, 18. What does it say? It says, do not remember the former things. Nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Shall you not know it? Let me explain one thing to you and real quick and we're going to break bread. I promise you this time we will break this bread. God is saying you need a fresh revelation. In order for you to get it, first of all, put aside the former things. Okay? I'm glad you've studied the word. I'm glad you've gone to conferences. I'm glad you've gone on the mission. I'm glad you've done all those things. But now, don't limit your expectation about the things that are behind you. I want to do a new thing that none of you could have earned, that none of you could have been able to orchestrate on your own. He says, the only thing I'm asking for you is you have to know it before I do it. <laughs> he said, behold, I do a new thing. Shall you not know it? Because God says, will I do a thing without first of all revealing it to myself as the prophet? God is revealing it, but you are not still enough to see it. He told Moses, Moses was frustrated because people were complaining. So Moses was pacing back and forth. What am I going to do? Egypt is coming behind us, Pharaoh and his host. And now these people are about to eat me alive. Look at the stones in their hands. They're about to stone me. And he kept on going. And God was like, oh my goodness. So after God was done, God was tired of his pacing back and forth. He said, peace to you. And you will see my salvation. My salvation is already here, but you're not allowing yourself to see it. He told the same thing to Abraham. He says, Abraham, just lift up your head. That's all I'm asking you to do. And you will see the ram that is caught in the thicket. Everything that you need is already there. God just wants you to know it. I want you to raise your right hand. In my case, I'm going to lift my left hand and say, Lord, I need a revelation. I need a, oh, 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 wait a minute. Come to Matthew 17, Holy Ghost. I saw the Lord handing this out. Holy Ghost. Come to Matthew chapter 17. Oh my goodness. This is all Sion. 
Holy Ghost. No, Matthew 13, verse 44. Let's see. Matthew 13, 44. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. How was the man able to afford to acquire the field? Revelation. The Bible says he found it. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Everything. As soon as we, we raised our hands, I saw an envelope and on it was written this verse of scripture. Let me tell you something. God is saying that everything that you need, just find the revelation behind it. The moment you find that which is hidden, then you will receive that treasure. So as we break bread today, okay, now one more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more, one more. Because this thing has to be as clear as can be. You need to connect this one. You need to connect this one. The Lord wants you to believe that he is a good God. In Matthew 7, 11, it says, you being evil know how to give good gifts. How much more your father in heaven. And so when you're seeking revelation, don't seek revelation as though God is so mean, he's hiding it from you. No, God is so good, he has hidden it so that those people who are looking for what to steal and what to kill and destroy will not find it. So it is out of the goodness of his heart. So thank him because he has hidden these things and made it a privilege for you to find it. Because your heart needs to be right in seeking so that you can seek and find and receive revelation that will do you good. And so right now in the mighty name of Jesus, with all of that being said, I want you to lay hold of the bread and be prepared to drink the wine. To drink off the wine. Because this bread at the word of the Lord is the body of the Lord Jesus. And this wine at the word of the Lord is the blood of the Lamb of God who loved you and gave himself for you. He has loved you right from the beginning. And because that love is an everlasting love, that means he loved you, he loves you, and he will forever love you. And so now let your eyes be open that you may see that which is the height and the depth of the inheritance that God has in you and for you. You may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. In Jesus' name. Don't chew too quickly. Don't chew too quickly. And don't swallow too quickly because there is a scripture here in the book of Ephesians that I'm just going to read over you because I believe it will consolidate the understanding and the knowledge that we have of him. So turn in your Bibles with me very quickly to the book of Ephesians. Are you ready? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 8. I want you to digest this scripture with the communion that you have just had. Alrighty. What does it say? If, no, not eight, 18, I believe. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. He says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the what? The hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places? Everything that God has for you, the, the height and the depth of it, 
is already a finished work because Jesus is seated in heavenly places. And so don't sell yourself short. Receive as much as you can. Let your eyes, in fact, this is after your eyes have been opened. And I believe that having obeyed the leading of the Holy Spirit, obeyed the word of God and followed the leading of the Holy Spirit, now I am ministering to each and every one of you. Your eyes of understanding are hereby opened now begin to see and receive with an open heart that which the Lord has said. Let it go into the fertile soil of your heart. Let hope be revived within you. Like hope was stirred up in Noah, let hope be revived within you so that you also might get up and begin to cultivate the atmosphere for miracles. In the mighty name of Jesus. I am delighted and excited that the Lord is doing this amongst us today because he announced to us just a couple of days ago, Brother Matthew, that we are in a season of miracles. But you have to be able to engage those miracles. Let's go and engage our miracles by revelation. One more thing that I'm going to pray over you today and then we're just going to take the offering and some announcements is this. Come with me to the book of Psalms 134. Yeah, Psalms 134. You see, we're going to read the first three verses. And I want you to read along with me if you can, especially these first three verses, which are the only three verses in Psalms 134, okay? He says, bless, he said, behold, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hand in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. This is amazing. The word of God says, bless the Lord who has blessed you. If you do not take anything with you post the breaking of bread, I want you to take this with you. The Bible says that God has blessed you from Zion, but you need to bless the Lord. Shayla, can you bless the Lord when you have nothing in your hands? The Lord is saying, Bless me, the one who has blessed you. You know, I mentioned about time jump earlier on, and I said the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was a gory tale, but there's a glory flip side to it. And the glory flip side is that the level that you're at right now may be limiting what you can receive of God but you do not have to remain at that level because your heavenly father allows for you and is interested in seeing you time jump, which means to go from the level that you're at in October 2022 and access your faith level in November 2027 because you are not trapped in time. Ah. Uh, let me say this again, folks. In the realm of the spirit, right? Everything is already yours. But in the natural, you're expected to grow. One day at a time, according to Christian Lane, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. That is one level of being in God. Wherein you're, little by little, you're growing. But there are times wherein you can access your future self. If the devil can access who you were in the past to condemn you and make you feel guilty, who says you cannot access who you already are in the future to shame the devil? You see, there is a faith level that you're going to be operating. I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you fairy tales. I am telling you something that I heard from my heavenly father himself. The Lord told me one day, he said the problem that I was having at that particular season of my life, he said it because I could only see myself as I am. He says, I am dealing with you as you will be because that is what I'm investing in today. 
He says, what I am doing now, this conversation we're having, it's not for today. What are you doing in this little room that you're at? He said, it's because of who I see. So if God is accessing my future to relate with me now, then I need to be able to access faith that I have not yet grown into by believing. Now, having said that, read this scripture again. What does it say? He says, Bless the Lord, all you servants of the, of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hand in the sanctuary and bless the Lord, the Lord who made heaven and earth. He blesses you from Zion. From where? From his holy habitation, from heaven. So if that is where he's at, and we know, because we have just read in Ephesians, that every blessing is because Jesus is already seated at the right hand, of, right hand of the Father. And you are in Jesus. The way to access your future self is to just go deeper in him. And you can even ask and tell him, and say, Jesus, the faith that I have been able to muster with my current experiences is not delivering the miracle that I want. I need to borrow. I want to draw from my future self. Let me tell you something. Some days God, God draws from your future self because of the fact that the you that is looking at right now is not very encouraging. You understand what I mean? So he draws from your future self. Jesus was looking at Peter and he saw somebody that would go through tribulation, someone whose faith was standing on half a leg and he was like, I'm going to relate with you as the one that will be there taking care of his brethren. You've heard me teach that before, right? Let me explain something to you and we're going to close. Do you know that Jesus saw that Satan was speaking through Peter? That Peter was struggling, begging for faith. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, help us. We're in trouble. If you leave us, what are we going to do? And you know what Jesus said to him? Jesus says, when you're restored, restore your brethren. And Peter had not even fallen. But Jesus was talking about the fact that he will, after he's already fallen, Jesus was not talking about when he will fall. He was talking about when Peter is already restored in the future. And that was how he strengthened him in the presence. Jesus was fishing into the future of Peter to strengthen him. So why can't you do the same? Don't stay where you're at because you are inexcusable. You can't tell God that you don't have enough when he has already given you everything. He says, when you know that the blessing is in Zion, did we lock you out of Zion? I haven't locked you out of heaven. Heaven is in timelessness. You can choose what part of time you want to access and I will give it to you because I have chosen to reserve the mysteries to you and your children. Tomorrow is a mystery. People don't know it, but do we not? Tomorrow is a mystery. People don't know it. But we do. Because we have an unction from the Holy One and we know all things. And so I want to encourage you. Stretch your faith. And you will see boundaries upon boundaries that have constituted limitations. You will see them beneath you. You will soar upon your high places. That is literally what it means to walk upon your high places. So no matter how high the wall of limitation is, it doesn't stop you. We're going to wrap up on that note because of the fact that I, I am feeling the pull from your spirits just to be able to lay hold of that revelation. I've only gotten you started and I'm thankful for the opportunity that I have had to get you started. But the ball is now in your court. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. And what that means is you need to be conscious of the power of God that is able to save, able to deliver, able to strengthen you and able to lift you up to walk upon your high places so that at the end of the day when it is said and done, you are not giving excuses. You are producing fruits and delivering good works that bring glory to your heavenly father. Please bow your heads. I want to pray over you one minute. I'm going to pray over you today from the book of Revelations, chapter 12, verse 3. You don't have to read it. You just continue to pray where you're at. Just thank God that he came through for you today with an insight that encourages you to pursue the mysteries of the kingdom, to develop an appetite, of, an appetite for mysteries, for revelations that will elevate you from where you are now to where you need to be. Even if it means time jumping into the future to access a new level of faith 
to break the chains of the present. Revelation chapter 12 verse 3. The Bible says, And another sign appeared in the heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. No, no, it's 13 verse 2, not 12 verse 3. 13 verse 2, it says, Now the beast which was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon gave him what? His power, his throne, and great authority. Verse 3 says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. I am praying over you today because what we have just read here is the strategy that was given to the enemy to fulfill his assignment. And it is a divine strategy. And the divine strategy is that the one who has already attained was able to give to the one who has now been assigned power. If the enemy is doing this in the world today, it is only because Jesus has already done it. And if Satan giving power to the beast brings healing, then you know that Jesus already did exactly that for you to give you power, to give you his throne and then to give you authority over snakes and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy that you may be healed and that you may be functional in the kingdom as a fruit bearing tree in the house of the Lord. Don't let the enemy use successfully what God has already given to you and you are struggling to deliver. So I speak to you today that your faith may be challenged, that you may recognize that you are privileged, that you may recognize that power is required and it has also been given. So now you need to acquire that power and the confidence as one having authority to speak to your blessings to manifest in the mighty name of Jesus. So as I'm speaking to you today, let your faith be roused. Let your confidence be stirred and let your boldness in the workings of the things of God come to maturity so that you can deliver as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a hope that makes not ashamed. You will not be put to shame, but the Lord will receive glory from your life through your obedience in the mighty name of Jesus. I pray for everybody here to awake in the areas where they have been sleeping. Awake unto righteousness and no longer continue to fall short of the glory of God. Awake in the ability to see the ram that's been caught in the thicket. Awake in the ability to be able to say no to emotions and yes to the Holy Spirit. Awake unto righteousness. Awake to the authority with which Jesus has commanded you to occupy until he comes. When I see you next, I want to see you radiating a new level of glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is my desire that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. But above all things, I pray that Christ is going to be seen in you, the hope of glory. You will see and you will be seen in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Alrighty, God is good. So let's, let's draw the curtain on that today. Um... The Holy Spirit revealed that to me. I was like, I saw the end of the service and I saw myself pressing in, in prayer. I was pressing in, you know, using revelation. And the Holy Spirit said to me, yeah, that is needed. And I totally forgot about it until we got to that end of service. And what I was doing there, pray, praying for you, is pressing in also on your behalf. But let me tell you this, you need to pick it up from there. And you press in as well. If you're wondering, why would I use the example of the power of Satan and the beast to stir you up? When we were children, if we're doing badly, you know what our parents would do? They would show us our cousins, show us the neighbors. If we're doing badly, badly to do badly? Yeah, to do badly. If we're doing badly, what the parents would do is they would show us other people and say, look, even those people, they don't have what you have. And look at what they're able to accomplish. They are struggling in this area and in that area and yet they're accomplishing, accomplishing all of this. But look at you. And that is the reason why I believe the Holy Spirit would have me show you what Satan is doing. Even with the power that he received. 
You know, the Bible says the red fiery dragon was the one that gave power to the beast. You know why the Lord described him like that? Because that was the same dragon that was given power to deceive the nations. So he was sharing of the power that he has received. And Jesus did the same. And that's why Satan is copying what Jesus did. Jesus gave to you of the power that he received when he went to hell and spoiled principalities and powers because he told you to occupy until he returns. So you need to be able to unnest the power, sit on the throne and speak with authority so that your wounds can be healed. Anyway, praise the Lord. We're going to go ahead right now and look on the screen. Did Alan take the offering earlier? No. Alrighty. So the offering instructions are going to be on the screen. Um, I want to encourage you, please, this coming Saturday, the women are going to have their conference, right? The retreat that they've been planning for a while now. So majority of the women here and that come here may not be here, but we're still going to have a service. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. So what that means is that so that it is not just myself and Isaac, I want to encourage you, invite people, okay? Bring people, tell them we will be meeting on Saturday. If you remember anybody that is in here, check on them and see where they're at. Invite them so that Saturday next week, we don't want to miss the absence of the women. Let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can have more people come in and fill the places where my wife, Manuelita, Anita, and Diamond, where they normally sit, where Josephine normally sits, and Anita. In fact, maybe on that day, you know, we would record a video of the worship and send to Anita and say, oh, you're not here, but we're not missing you. Say that again. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I know what I'm saying. Yeah, because we know. Yeah, we, I'm going to tell you later. All right, but at the end of the day, what I want us to do is let's make it a great time of fellowship together. And the Lord will lead you because it's not everybody that needs to be here. These teachings, incidentally, are not for everybody. Not everybody has developed the appetite for such truths of the kingdom. But God will lead you to the people that will be able to take it and do something with it for a transformative experience that will bring them closer to seeing the kingdom come even in their own lives. So I want you to be led to invite the people that need to be here. On Tuesday, we are on again. It's going to be an amazing time. And lastly, tomorrow is when we have the cookout at our house. If you don't have the address yet, please see Alan afterwards. But let's, let's make it a great time of fun and fellowship together. Alrighty, God is good. So let us rise up to our feet as we bless the offerings. Praise the Lord. The Bible says it is the Lord that gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. And so there is nothing that we have of our own that we have not received, received from above. Everything is God's and so when we give it back to him, it is worship. Because it's his anyway. So why don't we just go ahead right now and package our offerings if we haven't. I'm doing mine right now, covering the processing payment. If you're using one of them online platforms. And if you're actually given an offering envelope... Alan has the offering basket right over there. Don't worry, feel free to approach it. Nothing's going to stop you. And so, um, what else do we need to do? Okay, God is good. So now, let's raise our phones. For those of us who are giving by phone, let's just raise our hands and just say, Father, we thank you for the privilege once again of being able to give in your name as a form of worship. And we thank you for Communion House that receives this into the treasury of the kingdom. Lord, may we continue to grow by it and grow in it and grow in the generosity that is an attribute of your Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Very quickly, before we close it out, I want us to pray for children. Let's pray for the children. What I saw is a fishing net, but like a small fishing net. You know when someone is not throw in a net. What do they call those things? They're like a fishing net, but they look like a, the net you use to clean a swimming pool. I know there's a name for it, just like a little fishing net. That's what I saw, a little fishing net in the hand of a giant, and it is coming in and scooping, but not fish this time around, but little children. And so let us pray that none of our children will be caught in the net of Satan. That none of our children will be caught in the trap of the enemy especially in this week that we are going into, that the disease of the Egyptian will not come near our dwelling place, neither would any fly of Satan nest upon our children. 
Father, in the matter name of Jesus, we set up an increase. We, de- we speak an increase in the fire, in the firewall that is around our children. This week in the matter name of Jesus, that it will burn off every attempt of the enemy. That it will neutralize every attempt of the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That none of our children will receive an invitation that will lead them astray. Neither will they say yes to the enticing invitations of the enemy. Whoever comes to entice them, they will not see. And the ones that they have seen, they will not follow. In the mighty name of Jesus. Your word says, my son, if sin has come to entice you, do not consent. We speak prophetically over our children today in godly authority. That when the enemy comes to entice them, that they will not consent. That they will not join those whose feet are quick to do evil. That they will remain steadfast in the place of purity before the Lord. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus even in the place of dreams our children will be protected from making wrong decisions in their dreams Lord when they look at computer screens they will behold no evil when they look at their phones they will see no guile and when they open their mouths they will speak no unrighteousness in the mighty name of Jesus in this week that we are going into Lord we will have reasons to rejoice over our children and to be confident in the leading of the Holy Spirit over their lives we will not sorrow over them we will not question having received them as gifts from you but we will thank you, O oh God, because your word says that children are your reward. The fruit of the womb is your reward. We thank you, Father, because these children are yours. And Lord, we will find by divine wisdom more and more ways to encourage them to move continuously in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And because of our obedience in that place of prayer, the enemy is staving off. The enemy is staving off. I want you all to remind me. Time is up. I'm not going to do this to you all. It's Saturday night. But I want you to remind me to teach you one of these days. It's been on my heart about the friends of Job. Many of us have such people in our lives, Bildad the Shuite, Zophar, the Nehemathite, and the other one, I always don't remember his name. But you see, many of us, in fact, why don't we do this? I want you to go and study the friends of Job. If you have a Bible, if if not everybody has it, it's a free Bible. There's a Bible that is called the Blue Letter Bible. The Blue Letter Bible. It has Hebrew, it has Greek, It has all of those things. Look at the meaning of their names. And the moment you see the meaning of their names, you will recognize people in your life who have come from the place of convenience, from the place of pleasure. Do you know that those people build that, the three friends of Job, they came from a place wherein by their fake success in the place of artificial comfort, they want to teach you the principles of the world and present it as the things of God. You see, those people, they speak to you on a daily basis. Recently, the Lord's been opening my eyes more and more to the friends of Job. And I believe it's not just for me, but it is for all of us as part of the signs of the times that we're in. So go and study the friends of Job. Bildad, the Shuite, the Nehemathite, and the Teamanatite. The other guy is from Teama. And so study all three of them, and particularly where they're from. And then you can begin to discern by the Spirit when people are coming from, when they offer you an advice, when they invite you to go out, when they suggest to you where to invest money. Most times their suggestions sound right. That's because you don't know where they're coming from. Study the friends of Job and the Lord will give you a spiritual compass with which to be able to determine where these people are coming from. Let me tell you something. You can't be sitting down two to four hours of teaching every week and still be falling for the traps of Satan. You might as well just go to a place where everybody has fun and they drink coffee and they, you know, go and watch movies afterwards. Alrighty, please, if you're sticking with these deep teachings, apply them. Be a deep Christian. A a very vibrant and spiritual warrior before the Lord. God bless you. I'll see you on Tuesday.